Becoming Beauvoir a Life by Kate Kirkpatrick. Third, Lover of God or Lover of Men. On the eve of her 19th birthday Beauvoir's diaries include reflections on a painful absence. As a child she believed that God governed her universe, and however questionable his governance looked in hindsight she was now left confronting different problems. If there was no one to call her to her vocation, could she have a vocation at all? If there was no God, what gave humans or anything their value? Maybe I have value, she says, but then, values must exist. She was not alone in asking these kinds of questions. Since the turn of the 20th century, Paris' philosophical elite had been debating the merits of religious belief and experience in the aftermath of Nietzsche's famous declaration that, God is dead? In Simone's life, the disappearance of God coincided with the courtship and death of her devout and beloved friend, Zsa, Zsa both of these losses would leave lasting legacies. For the better part of three decades, Beauvoir would feel that her own freedom had come at the cost of Zsa Zsa's life. By 1928 Beauvoir had discovered some of the alternative lives that Paris had to offer bohemianism and revolt, surrealism, cinema, ballet russe. That year, she began her studies at the Sorbonne in the company of an impressive cohort. The two Simones Beauvoir and Vile did not become friends although this seems like a missed opportunity in hindsight. Beauvoir was intrigued by Vile's reputation, not so much because of her intelligence, but because of her passionate concern for other chauffeuring. Beauvoir heard that Simone Vile wept when she heard about a famine breaking out in China and was impressed that her heart was large enough to ache even for people on the other side of the world. She wanted to meet this woman, but their meeting took a disappointing turn when the conversation shifted to the question, of which was, more important revolution so said, Vile or finding the reason for our existence so said Beauvoir. Vile ended their exchange with the words, it's easy to see you've never gone hungry. As Beauvoir saw it, Vile had looked her up and down and judged her, a high-minded little bourgeoise. At the time Beauvoir found this irritating after all. Vile didn't know her circumstances and was making mistaken assumptions, but in later years she became sympathetic to this judgment of her young self. Merlo Ponty, on the other hand, was to become Beauvoir's dear Ponty. He was a student at the Cole Normale Suprior, from a similar background to Beauvoir, and struggling with questions of faith. He sought Beauvoir out after the results of the general philosophy exam were published, and the two of them grew to be close friends first exchanging heartfelt conversation and later reading each other's work. Merlo ponty liked her so much he introduced her to his friend Maurice D. Gandalac, who found her brilliant and fascinating he was especially interested in the state of her faith. She liked Merlo ponty so much she introduced him to Zsa, Zsa and soon the foursome was playing tennis together every Sunday morning. Merlo Ponty was the first intellectual Zsa, Zsa had ever met, and before long she began to hope for something that hadn't seemed possible that she could fulfill her familial duty in marriage without relinquishing love or the life of her mind. At first Simone, too, was thrilled with her conversations with Merlo Ponty. They did have a great deal in common he was also raised in a devout home and, at least initially, considered himself a quiet unbeliever. At the Cole Normale Suprior, Merlo Ponty belonged to a group that had irreverently been christened the Holy Willies in account of their piety and respect for priests. Beauvoir had few female friends at school, and in later life admitted that she often dismissed women, whose intellects she found interesting on account of their religion or social background or both. Instead she became friends with other Holy Willies, including Jean Michel, who was, like her, preparing a thesis under the noted scholar Jean Barazzi. In her memoirs Beauvoir wrote that, she, went to hear Jean Barazzi, the author of a thesis that was very well thought of on Street John of the Cross. But in fact Beauvoir did more than go to hear Barazzi. She wrote a thesis of her own under his guidance. In her diaries Beauvoir wrote that she liked Barazzi, because he took her seriously and would criticize her. But in the memoirs Beauvoir is curiously silent about the philosophical content of her thesis, saying only that it, treated, the personality in that, Barazzi returned it to her with, copious praise, telling her that it was, the basis of a serious work. The diaries show that her work for Barazzi included discussions of love and ethics. The discrepancy between accounts raises the recurrent question why does her story lack consistency? 
Beauvoir's thesis itself has not survived, so we can't turn to it for possible answers. But on the basis of what Beauvoir was writing about it in her diaries at the same time, it seems likely that her discussions of love here prepared the ground for what she would go on to write in the 1940s about ethics, when her ideas were assumed to be indebted to Sartre's. So did she hide her early work from readers because she was concerned that it would somehow jeopardize Sartre's reputation? Or was it because she didn't think her 1950s readers would believe let alone identify with a female protagonist whose philosophy went on to shape Jean-Paul Sartre's? In the 1920s, Beauvoir had found few women who shared her intellectual passions. She recognized that she was beginning to turn to the company of men more and more for connections of the mind. She enjoyed men's conversation and friendship. In Memoirs of a Dutiful Daughter she wrote that she found it dismaying when women took up a challenging attitude towards men, from the start men were my comrades, not my enemies. Far from envying them, I felt that my own position, from the very fact that it was an unusual one, was a privilege. In hindsight she recognized that she was a token woman, but it was only later that she began to see this tokenism as problematic. In her student days, the friendly relations between Beauvoir and her male contemporaries were eased by the fact that they did not see her as a rival because the French education system did not treat them as equals. Simone, and all other female students, were accepted as supernumeraries and were not competing for the same jobs. The women were expected to teach in girls like S. The French state was providing education for girls. But it was still a widely held view that men should not educate them. As Dieter Baer tells the story, Beauvoir lost some of her initial enthusiasm for Merleau Ponty when it became clear that he was not an atheist. She was disappointed that he thought the truth was to be found within the religious boundaries of their upbringing. But once again, the details of Beauvoir's diaries tell a different and much less dispassionate story about her loss of faith than the bold lines of her memoirs suggest. As soon as she saw the light about God, she wrote in the memoirs, I made a clean break. After that, Beauvoir told her readers conclusively, her incredulity never once wavered. In language reminiscent of St. Augustine and Blaise Pascal, she described the experience of losing God as accompanied by the abrupt discovery that everything had fallen silent. For the first time she felt the terrible significance of the word alone. But the story in the student diaries is less sudden and once and for all. As late as 1928, at the age of 20, she was tempted by Catholicism. Although she later dismissed her childhood faith as enculturated and ingenuous, when she started university she suddenly found herself in the company of intellectual believers, whose commitments coexisted with doubts and willingness to question. She was a budding philosopher, and when she encountered a new argument she did not dig in her heels and remain unaffected in the name of consistency she considered its merits. But let us retrace the account she gave in the memoirs before looking at the diaries themselves. In the version of events published in 1958 Beauvoir acknowledged that as a child she developed a passionate faith in God the kind of faith a pious mother couldn't fake. Simone attended Mass three times a week and regularly undertook retreats for days at a time. She meditated and kept a notebook for recording her thoughts and saintly resolutions. She desired to grow closer to God, but didn't know how to go about it. She decided that the best life this world could offer was a life spent contemplating God and resolved to be a Carmelite nun. In later life Beauvoir would be converted to politics. But as a young woman she found social questions remote in part because she felt so powerless to change the world around her. Instead she focused on what she could control the world within. She had heard that in addition to the morality-infused religion of duty there was a mystical kind because she had read stories of saints whose passionate lives reached fulfillment in mysterious unions with God that brought them joy and peace. She invented mortifications for herself scrubbing her skin with a pumice stone until it bled and fustigating herself with a necklace chain. There is a long tradition of odium corporis in Christian history, and of bodily asceticism producing mystical experiences in many world religions. But Simone's efforts did not deliver the enlightened states she sought. In Memoirs of a Dutiful Daughter Beauvoir described her desire to be a nun as a convenient alibi. But she did not see it that way at the time. During her childhood summers in the countryside, 
she would wake early in order to watch nature awaken, enjoying the beauty of the earth and the glory of God. Several times in her memoirs she describes this association of the presence of God and the beauty of nature, but in Paris, she wrote, he was hidden from me by people and their top heavy preoccupations. She began to be more troubled by the hiddenness of God, concluding that God was a total stranger to the restless world of men. Her mother and teachers alike took the Pope to have been elected by the Holy Spirit. Both parents agreed that it was not his place to interfere in worldly matters. When Pope Leo XIII devoted encyclicals to social questions, therefore, her mother took him to have betrayed his saintly mission and her father took him to have betrayed the nation. So Simone had to swallow the paradox that the man chosen by God to be his representative on earth had not to concern himself with earthly things. She also had to face so-called Christian show-handled earthly inhabitants herself included in objectionable ways. At school she felt her confessor betrayed her confidence. And when she was 16, in a religious bookshop near St. Sulpice, she asked the shop assistant for an article. He walked towards the back of the shop and beckoned for her to follow. When she reached his side he revealed not the item she sought, but his erect penis. She fled, but took with her the feeling that the oddest things could happen to her without any warning. H. Elney also described their childhood as weighed down by God and noted that the weight of God was not felt equally by everyone. None of the men in her family either in Paris or Limousin went to Mass. This gave H. Elney reason to comment that men a superior race were exempt from God. It is not difficult to see why Beauvoir objected to the Catholicism of her childhood its values were taken to affirm double standards of colossal proportions profligate husbands expected saintly wives, while ideals of self-sacrifice consecrated women's suffering. In the memoirs of a dutiful daughter Beauvoir describes her unbeliever papa, and her devout mama as representing two extremes within herself her father represented the intellectual, and her mother the spiritual. And these two, radically heterogeneous fields of experience had nothing, in common she began to think that human things, culture, politics, business, manners, and customs had nothing to do with religion. So I set God apart from life in the world, and this attitude was to have a profound influence on my future development. In the end, faced with philosophical gaps and religious hypocrisy, she concluded that, it was easier for me to think of a world without a creator than of a creator burdened with all the contradictions in the world. After she rejected God for the first time, she confided to Zsa, Zsa that she wanted to be a writer. But Zsa, Zsa shocked her by replying that having nine children, like her mama had, was just as good as writing books. Beauvoir could not see anything in common in these two modes of existence. To have children, who in turn would have more children, was simply to go on playing the same old tune ad infinitum. As is often the case with Beauvoir's life-themed work, her life provided questions that her work sought to answer. She would return to religious questions in several books, including The Second Sex. But during the period of her studies, she had to wrestle with her own faith, first for academic reasons and then because one of the most significant losses of her life brought her face to face with death and injustice. During the period from 1926 to 27, she recorded in her diaries that despite her intellectual reservations she wanted to believe in God. She wanted to believe in something that would justify her life, something absolute, and throughout her life she would be revisited by this yearning for meaning, if not salvation. In May 1927 she wrote, I would want God. Then again in July she wanted God or nothing. But philosophically speaking, she couldn't find a satisfactory answer to the question, why the Christian God? She had several conversations about faith with Maurice Merlot, Ponty, but she thought that he put too much confidence in both Catholic faith and reason. On the 19th of July 1927 she wrote, in her diary that, Ponty supports his philosophy with faith and reason, I on the powerlessness of reason, who proves that Descartes prevails over Kant. I am maintaining what I wrote for the Sorbonne use your reason, you will end up with remainders and irrational elements. More and more, Beauvoir's diaries show that she found a certain kind of philosophy alienating, on account of its requirement to reason coldly she said that, young girls because herself have not only a reason to satisfy, but a heavy heart to subdue and in this way, I want to remain a woman.
still more masculine by her brain, more feminine by her sensibility. She kept trying to find a philosophy she could live by, and became interested in Jules Lagno, a philosopher who wrote about freedom and desire as well as reason. Beauvoir agreed with Lagno that her own desire was a powerful impulse to believe, oh. My God, my God, is this being whom we would like to love and to whom we would give all? Does this being truly not exist? I know nothing, and I am weary, weary. Why, if he is, does he make seeking him so difficult? Her heart felt achingly empty, she wrote that, the one who would fulfill everything doesn't exist. If these words had occurred a few pages earlier in her diaries it would be clear that they were penned for God, for a divine beloved. But in the margins a later annotate in is found later on Beauvoir underlined the words in this sentence in ink and wrote and underlined in the margin. Sartre 1929. Could a man occupy the place her heart had previously held for God? After Sartre died in 1980, Beauvoir entitled a volume of his letters to her witness to my life. The French word témoin witness was used by centuries of French Christians to describe the gaze of a God who saw everything. Beauvoir's path to atheism unwound in the midst of significant personal events as well as philosophical explorations. Personally, she found much to admire in the fates of Zsa, Zsa and Merleau-Ponty. While the bodily exploits of Street Fu and Gigi met with her disgust, the chaste courtship of Zsa, Zsa and Merleau-Ponty brought the teenage Simone much joy. She hoped, for Zsa, Zsa that marriage would not end up making a prostitute of her body and a mausoleum of her mind. Things had been blossoming promisingly, but suddenly it all came to a halt. Madame Lacoigne decided not to allow her to return to the Sorbonne for a second year, because her elder daughter was now married it was Zsa Zsa's turn. She was to be kept at the family estates in the lands so she could prepare to be presented to eligible men. This year, Simone was not invited to stay for weeks as she had done in the past, but only for a few days in July. Merlo Pontus' family was from Bordeaux. So he and Simone decided to meet there while she was en route to Zsa Zsa's. One of their favorite authors, Fran Oismoriak, was from the region and they wanted to make a literary pilgrimage happily. This would give Simone an opportunity to bring Zsa Zsa fresh news of her beloved. When Simone arrived, she found her friend agonizing over what were clearly becoming tortuously divided allegiances. Zsa Zsa felt sure that she loved Merlo Ponty, but she also wanted to obey her mother who had decided that the match was unsuitable without giving any indication why. No one could understand this about face on her mother's part he was from a good Catholic family and her mother never said a bad word about him. But if the conversation ever turned in his direction she moved it onto another subject. Beauvoir was perplexed by Madame Lacoigne's behavior at first. But her perplexity gave way to anxiety and anger. Why on earth would she object? Did she not see the importance of her own daughter's freedom? Her own daughter's dreams? The previous year had been intense, but emotionally high, and now Simone felt herself on an equally intense downward trajectory. She tried to cope as she always had writing, and reading, voraciously. In August, she wrote out a daily regime in her journal. 9-11 Letters and Journal 11-1, Philosophy in her journal she added meditation in parentheses. 3-5, Philosophy, Reading 5-8, Writing that summer she set herself the goal of reading Stentil and Plato, as well as recent and contemporary writers, whose books treated religion and mysticism Henry Frederick Amiel, Henry de la Croix, Jean Barazzi. Her diary contains reflections on her reading and correspondence and long passages professing love for Jacques and confusion about his intentions. In September, having read back her diary, Simone thought 1927 had been, a year of, oscillation between the discouragement brought to me by love, the only great human thing in which I felt the nothingness of the entirety of what's human, and the desire to seek. Later that month she made herself a new program of study she was working on two assignments for her supervisor, Jean Barazzi, and writing a book. She wanted to finish the first part of her book by January, so she would need to be disciplined. 8. Wake up. 9. Noon personal work in her room. 2 to 6. Serious study. 6 to 8. Conversations, painting, reading, without vain strolls to which I have no right. 9. 11. Preparation for classes. 
for the club. 11 Midnight Journal. She read novels by Paul Claudel, Fran, Ois Moriac and many others, as well as books on mystics, philosophers and the lives of novelists. She wrote notes for a novel that would chart the discovery of a woman's realization that she was free to choose herself. Her notes are fragmentary, but they explore the relationship between who we are and what we do what philosophers would call the relationship between being and action. At 19, she was already experimenting with ideas that would become famous in the 1940s for being existentialist in other words. Sartre's, the act is the affirmation ourselves. Beauvoir wrote. But if that's the case, she asked, then, did this, ourselves then not exist before the act? Or were we just unsure that it existed? The philosopher Maurice Blondel had written a book on action not long before which explored big questions like whether or not human lives were meaningful, and whether or not individuals have destinies. Blondel wrote that, the substance of man is action. He is what he makes of himself. Beauvoir's notes for the novel seem to reply to Blondel as well as Nietzsche. She wanted to know whether our actions acquaint us with ourselves whether we were there all along or whether they create us. Blondel said that the latter was the case we are what we make of ourselves. But Nietzsche's command was to become who you are. But how could you become who you are if you don't know yourself? Beauvoir's notes are full of questions become who you are. Do you know yourself? Do you see yourself? Her days were so regimented now that when she wasn't working she began to worry about scattering herself too much in charming friendships. But even so, it was a blow when Zsa, Zsa came back to Paris in November and told Beauvoir that she was being sent to Berlin. Ostensibly it was to perfect her already excellent German. Really it was to try to make her forget Merleau-Ponty. She was anguished by her parents' opposition to him what could they possibly object to? Beauvoir's bewilderment was exacerbated by conversations with Merleau-Ponty, who said little except that he put his trust in prayer and believed in the kindness and justness of God. His professions of faith made Beauvoir increasingly bitter. How could he be satisfied with the mere possibility of justice in the hereafter? Whether God was just or not, in her experience Madame Lecoigne was not. Zsa, Zsa returned to Paris in the winter of 1929, looking well and even more convinced of her love for Merleau-Ponty. Her mother presented more and more obstacles to her meeting with Simone, but she could hardly forbid her daughter to read at the Bibliothe Q Nationale. Here Zsa, Zsa and Simone found small pockets of space and time to drink coffee together illicitly and discuss life. In January 1929 Beauvoir became the first woman to teach philosophy in a boys' school, the like E. Jansen D. Saley. Her fellow teachers there included Merleau-Ponty and another soon-to-be household name of 20th century, French intellectual life Claude L. V. Strauss, the founder of structural anthropology. The like he was full of just the type of boy Beauvoir used to envy. They didn't care much about philosophy they took education for granted. But she did not take it for granted that she was now a guardian of the French intellectual light. She felt like she was on that road to final liberation. She described feeling that there was nothing in the world she couldn't attain now. Her decision to reject classics had been the right one she was now writing a dissertation on the philosophy of Gottfried Leibniz under the supervision of Elon Brunschweig, a leading light of Parisian philosophy. The spring and summer of 1929 were eventful seasons in Beauvoir's life. But for Zsa, Zsa they were disastrous. In July, she went to their summer home as usual. But before she left she confided to Beauvoir that she and Merleau-Ponty had become secretly betrothed he was going into military service, and they would wait another year, or possibly two, before making the case to her parents. Beauvoir was astonished. Why wait? She asked her friend, shocking Zsa, Zsa with her frankness their affection was clear. Zsa Zsa's letters from the lands became cryptic and confusing. Her mama, she wrote, had told her something she couldn't explain? The next post brought a letter with more, can children bear the sin of their parents? Are they guilty of it? Can they ever be absolved? Do others near them suffer from it? The correspondence that followed revealed that Zsa, Zsa was disappointed by the messages she was receiving from Merleau-Ponty, for despite their promise to each other his tone became increasingly distant and his letters increasingly sparse. She missed Simone and said she was suffering. 
but she tried to give meaning to her suffering by comparing it to Christ's. This situation continued for some time and Simone became seriously concerned. Urging both Zsa, Zsa and Merlo Ponti to make their intentions public perhaps Madame Lacoigne's hesitation was due to their lack of official announcement. But she met with resistance in both quarters Zsa, Zsa wrote to her that he has reasons for not doing so which to me are as valid as they are to him. Simone was not so easily satisfied, so she wrote to Merlo Ponti, thinking he could not possibly act this way if he knew the suffering his so-called reasons cost Zsa, Zsa. But he wrote back explaining that his sister had just become engaged and his brother was about to go abroad, and his mother could not bear to lose all of her children at once. Zsa, Zsa had grown thin, she was to be sent to Berlin again. At first she seemed resigned to Merlo Pontus decision to sacrifice her for his mother. But not much later Madame Lacoigne summoned Simone Zsa, Zsa was ill, very ill. Zsa, Zsa had gone to see Merlo Pontus mother, delirious, asking whether she hated her and why she objected to their marriage. Madame Merlo Ponti attempted to calm her down before her son arrived he called a taxi, worried by Zsa, Zsa burning hands and forehead. In the cab she reproached him for never having kissed her and demanded that he make amends he complied. Madame Lacoigne called a doctor and had a long conversation with Merlo Ponti, after which she relented. She would not oppose their marriage, she could no longer be the cause of her daughter's unhappiness. Madame Merlo Ponti agreed, it would all be arranged. But Zsa Zsa's temperature was 104 degrees she spent four days in a clinic and it did not fall. The next time Simone saw Zsa Zsa her body was cold, laid out on a bier clutching a crucifix. Zsa Zsa died on 25 November 1929. Beauvoir would have to wait nearly 30 years to discover the truth about what happened. As she sank into the hopelessness of grief, she felt confused, angry horror at her conversations with Zsa Zsa and correspondence with Merlo Ponti they both spiritualize each hair suffering, trying to cultivate virtue in themselves instead of castigating the real culprit the vicious injustice of propriety. It was the world, not them, that was at fault and God had done nothing.